I cycled to the nearest airport, got a flight back to Scotland, sold all my stuff in car boot sales, I bought a £300 city bike, loaded it up, all the wrong equipment and off I went. But I just followed my heart and it's turned out to be the best thing I've ever done. This is Explore by The Cycling Podcast, in association with Rafa. Adventure starts anywhere. Surely this is the most professional thing that's ever been recorded. <laughs> no? I just can, uh, just can imagine me KOing myself within the first 100 metres or something. I've never had an audio recording of me falling off a bike. <laughs> science in sport. Fueled by science. This is the thing, isn't it, about the, the thing that would freak me out about riding at night. What? Well, what and also my, my eye sensitivity to the light. You've got very, yeah, <laughs> very, very sensitive good. eyes, obviously. Yeah. Not being able to see the road surface would be the thing that would worry me. Well, this was the thing, actually. So a couple, a few years ago, I did the Dunwich Dynamo. You know, the one which starts in East yeah. London and they ride through the night. Yeah. And that was the problem. Once you start to get to kind of... 2 a.m. or no actually when you start to get to like 4 a.m. and it starts to get a bit light so then the shadows really start to play on your on your eyesight and on and you start to see things and stuff yeah well funnily enough the Dunwich Dynamo was sort of one of the inspirations for the Cambridge Southwold Cambridge Classic that I did with Ned oh really because I've always wanted to do the Dunwich Dynamo (laughs) Partly because it finishes with fish and chips and a pint. Oh, that was the best bit. Well, obviously. And but it's in July. Yeah. So again, I'm always at the tour and can't can't do it. So my first idea was why not organise an unofficial Dunwich Dynamo, but do it during the day. But then I thought, no, I'll uh, I'll see whether Ned wants to go for a bike ride. I want to go to Southwold and then he said well can we start in Cambridge the reason I wanted to start in Southwold get finish in Southwold was because went on childhood holidays there in half term have very fond memories and then Ned said well in that case can we start in Cambridge where he went to college Ned bolting there dancing away on the pedals in that inimitable style in his trademark flat-soled suede cycling shoes hovering just above his brook saddle England flag fluttering in the breeze. That's why they call him the flag bearer of Bedford. A lot of people weren't sure whether or not it existed. Had not definitely seen it, but knew it might be out there lurking somewhere ready to strike. This beast went by the name of the Geraint Thomas Bad Day. (laughs) Did it even exist? Was it a bit like the Jens Bocht Slightly Reticent Day? A work of fiction was a bit like the Cadell Evans mentally balanced today. Welcome to episode four of Explore by the Cycling Podcast. My name's Lionel Burney. I'm with Hannah Troop. Hello, Hannah. Hello, Lionel. We're in central London on a cold grey day, but this episode takes us back to the summer when the sun shone almost unbroken for six months, it seemed, at the time. And Ned Bolting and I went on a bike ride from Cambridge to Southwold and back to Cambridge. What an epic journey that was. Yes, I feel like I got the short straw because I ended up having to do the attack and you decided you were going to do no mountains whatsoever and take on something that you named the low route. (laughs) I did well yes it's the opposite to the Haute route which takes riders up every mountain that they can see on the horizon Um, much more my style really is avoiding the hills I like riding on the flat nothing wrong with that Um, last year uh, Simon Gill and a friend of his and I we did our own version of bike packing where we cycled out to Chipping Camden in the Cotswolds and back and I basically used a courier service to take a change of clothes and a fresh set of cycling kit for me Um, so it was waiting at the hotel at the other end and then I used the courier service to send it back home again I thought that was very civilised this year I was so disorganised for the Cambridge Southwold Cambridge Classic as I've nicknamed it that um, 
I didn't book a courier in time, so I had to ask Ned Bolting and Simon Gill to carry my stuff for me. How humiliating. Humiliating or savvy, maybe. And, uh, and well, I mean, I think that was quite well sort of unplanned, <laughs> so to speak. And at the end of the day, I think if, uh, if you're going to have any loyal domestiques, then uh, Simon, the photographer, is a good one to have, as well as Ned. Absolutely. Um, yeah, this is the, the sort of the the opposite end of the spectrum and and i guess this journey is to prove that anyone of any ability can go out and have a really great couple of days on a bike if the countryside and the company are um, to their liking which on this occasion they both were um you heard me attempting a bit of commentary there as ned was dancing up one of the very few hills in suffolk uh, that will probably explain why he is the lead commentator on itv's tour de france com- coverage and i'm not but if you are unfamiliar with ned bolting and i can't imagine anyone who doesn't know who ned bolting is but if you if you don't he's itv's tour de france commentator you may not know that he does a live stage show in the autumn last year it was called bikeology this year the tour de ned and you've heard a, a little clip of him on the stage there and uh, he's just great company he's got a really good way of looking at the world on two wheels i think Yes, yeah, so uh, he's also written a, a couple of books over the years as well, which are very funny and an interesting look into the world of cycling and the Tour de France. And and I can imagine that you're very much of the same kind of level of mentality about cycling, actually. Yeah, but I think he's better than me because I turned up on my um, full carbon look race bike uh, with no luggage and he was riding his heavy city bike with not just his luggage but some of my luggage as well Mm, not sure uh, well the thing was we were both cycling at the same speed so it actually did work out perfectly don't worry though you will hear from from some proper cyclists later on in this episode i don't know why i'm being so self-deprecating this was proper cycling we did a couple of hundred miles in in two and a half days that still counts doesn't it was it miles or was it kilometers oh let's not get into that one again (laughs) but you will hear also from professional riders connor dunn and larry warbass who rode for the aqua blue sport professional team they were preparing for the tour of britain in september when they heard the team was folding with immediate effect and uh, rather than sit at home and and sulk about it or feel sorry for themselves they organized the self-supported no-go tour basically a bikepacking adventure through the french and italian alps Um, and we made a friends of the podcast audio diary connor and larry recorded their thoughts and we put that out for friends of the podcast you can hear that by signing up at thecyclingpodcast.com if you want to hear more from them but they're coming up a bit later on in this episode yeah that's when i caught up with larry and connor at the calapam gland for the cycling podcast live event that was back in november and it was really good fun to just chat to them i actually separated them because there's been quite a lot of interviews where they've been together and i separated them to try and find out what was the worst bits about that the other person did and how to try and maintain a friendship whilst doing a bike packing holiday yeah that's an important point really because uh you know friendships can form or fall apart on the road i mean ned and, ned and i very fortunately i don't think i got on ned's nerves maybe people will listen to this and, and think differently i don't know what about simon <laughs> i don't think simon simon is so mild-mannered that even if, even when i know i'm getting on his nerves he, he never lets on i mean oh i feel bad about that now as well he's he's just too nice Anyway, we're also going to hear from a truly extraordinary cyclist, Ishbel Holmes, in uh, the third part of this episode of Explore. She is the author of Me, My Bike and a Street Dog Called Lucy. You may know her as World Bike Girl on social media. Uh, well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll introduce that when we get to that part later on. Just, um, It's quite a long episode, this, isn't it, Hannah? We've had a couple of emails in from people saying they've loved, been loving the series, but the episodes are long. Um, well they are but uh, we're making kind of a box set approach here aren't we we're we, they don't all have to be listened to all in one go you can press pause and, and pick it up because series two may well not be out until autumn 2019 so you've got a long time to listen exactly if you can split each episode over a couple or two or three listens then it just extends the happiness and and the glorious audio that we're putting out for you (laughs) what a wonderful way of putting it i've got the same approach to cycling because if you go just that little bit slower you extend the fun brilliant brilliant (laughs) before we join ned bolting on a ride across the english countryside i need to tell you that this series of explore is sponsored by the economist 
The Economist is about far more than just economics and finance. It covers a range of subjects from politics and business to science, technology, the arts, the environment and even sport. The Economist helps readers prepare for what is going on in the world around them and in today's dynamic world, facts matter more than ever. All UK-based listeners can get a free print copy of The Economist delivered to their door by texting the word CYCLE to 78070. Now, I've been reading The Economist regularly for several months now, and in recent weeks I've been absorbing their coverage of Brexit, the simmering trade war between China and the USA, and the cause of the Gilets Jaunes protesters in Paris. But what I love about reading The Economist every week is that it covers stories that I know nothing about and don't tend to see in even the upmarket British newspapers. One that really interested me this week is headlined Battery Farming. Before reading this, I didn't know that so much of the world's cobalt, which is needed to make batteries, comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. With the world moving towards electric cars and even electric bikes, the question is not just whether there's enough cobalt to cope with the demand, but whether it can be sourced ethically in Congo. Several tech firms have come under pressure to ensure that they're not using what's called conflict cobalt. But battery technology is also evolving, according to the article, which says that Tesla, one of the leading electric car manufacturers, is working to achieve close to zero use of cobalt. Now, I knew nothing about this story before reading The Economist, and that's just one example of uh, something that I knew nothing about prior to reading the magazine. So if you would like to get a copy of The Economist and see what kind of stories they do that might interest you, Text the word CYCLE, that's C-Y-C-L-E, to 78070. And if you're based in the UK, you can get a free print copy. Welcome, Ned, to the very informal sign-on of the Cambridge South World Classic 2018. Could be the start of a massive thing, couldn't it? We both sense that. I think that this is um, the genesis of. We're in a, this is an Henri de Grange moment, isn't it? In many ways, this is like 1903, July 1903. This could be um, 100 years from now. People will be talking about this, but it's an inauspicious start. I, say, I have to say because we're both standing in the, the um, station car park outside Cambridge Station, clutching banana skins that we don't know what to do with. We've eaten the bananas. We're about to set off, and we're contemplating whether or not we just chuck them under the car and let them fester. Well, we may find a bin on the way out of the car park. I think that would be the environmentally considerate thing to do. But yeah, we're here. It wasn't what you suggested, though, was it? It wasn't what I know. You said just chuck them under the car, let's be honest. (laughs) Yeah. But now we're suddenly recording. It's a different story, isn't it? You're familiar with how the cycling podcast works in all its many guises. I hope you're not going to call out all the uh, no, audio no. audio fakery over no, the next two days. No. Um, but I don't think there'll be any need for any. Just to explain to people a little bit who we are and what we're doing. My name's Lionel Burney. That was the voice of Ned Bolting. I resisted the urge to say television's Ned Bolting there. Well, you've got you've got televisions, Daniel Freeb. So we can't be we can't have the same you know thing going on, can we at all? And my mate Simon, the photographer, yep. who is also joining us. Say hello, Simon. Shout. Hello there. <laughs> and we, um, well, we had this crazy idea last year, Simon and I. It's not so crazy, really, but an unsupported ride to somewhere and back. And last year we went to Chipping Camden in the Cotswolds. We rode, rode out on the first day and rode back on the second day. Last year I actually posted some clothes in a box and they arrived at the hotel we were staying at i mean this gives you an indication of how cut out i am for these kind of epic sorts of rides simon's actually just back from the transatlantic way ride in ireland 2200 kilometers in nine days nine days ten hours Nine days, ten hours. He looks... He's like Ranald Fiennes. He's come back from the North Pole. He's got you know, sun blist, sunburn blisters on his fingers from the wind and the conditions and everything. I feel humbled by his very presence. <laughs> the fact that we're doing... What are we doing today? 50 miles? It, no, it's no, no, no. 50 kilometres. 50 kilometres. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, sorry. 50 kilometres uh, today. Uh, yeah, so we're going from Cambridge to Southwold on the Suffolk coast and back to Cambridge and the idea was originally to do it in two days um, but as we set off I'll explain why the the format of the race race (laughs) format of the the ride has changed a little bit since its uh, initial um, since I initially came up with it but first of all Simon how are the legs? Uh, Legs varicose veiny worse than ever yeah blue veins popping out everywhere Um, and Ned have you been doing much cycling? No. No, I, I, not, you know, bits, pooting around town, that sort of thing. Tell me what you're riding. 
I'm riding my town bike, which uh, is a m- m- mongrel of a thing, and it's <laughs> filthy, um, and it's dented, and it's really heavy, and um, I love it. Yeah, it's blue Tifosi frame, brook saddle, you've got a bag on the back, an England Cross of St George flag yeah. on there. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that later, because I think tomorrow we're going to maybe maybe stop off and actually watch um, watch our boys destroy Panama in the World <laughs> Cup. Well, that dates it. It's uh, June um, you'll be listening to this in the autumn, but it's uh, late June. It quite, it's quite nice and warm. It's about probably about 20 degrees at the moment. Um, and we are riding today from Cambridge to Bury St Edmunds. So um, let's get on the road. Can I do something with this banana skin now? Ned, why did we start in Cambridge? Uh, well, Cambridge and I go back a fair while. Oh, you're reminding me of how old I am now. It's terrible. The passing of the years. Um, I, I uh, went to university there by hook or by nook, don't know how I wangled a place, but I did. Um, I went to Jesus College in Cambridge. And, um, do you know, even prior to that, though, because I grew up in Bedford, which is only a little way, way down the road from Cambridge. So we quite often used to come across to Cambridge. So all throughout my childhood, I kind of visited it quite often. We had friends who lived on Maddingley Road in Cambridge, uh, my mum and dad's friends, and we used to go and stay with them quite often. And then, this is quite interesting, their next-door neighbour was Clive Sinclair, right, off of the C5 and all that sort of thing. The Sinclair's son, one of their sons, was a bit lively. And I remember he um, shot one of my friends with an air rifle up the arse. <laughs> that was my first memory of Cambridge. Um, but after... <laughs> Later on, I ended up going to university there. And, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a weird place. I mean, I, I can't say that it's uh, a spiritual home or anything, but it certainly left a stamp on me for sure. When you were a student, did you ride a bike around the city or were you punting to your lectures? <laughs> well, it, when I was a student, I, so I took a bike off to university with me in the back of the Datsun estate that my dad drove me to university to, you know, it's a sort of scene that's replicated a million times over every, every year. And within, a, within six months, I'd been nicked. And I was 18 years old, and that was the end of me and cycling, right up until my first Tour de France in 2003, um, which is a long time later, um, when I came back from that Tour de France and bought my next bike. And so there was a kind of prolonged hiatus between my bike in Cambridge getting nicked and then my introduction to the Tour de France in 2003. So uh, tell me about the bike you're riding and, and why you've chosen... I mean, I'm riding like a, a real race bike. Like, yeah. uh, you know, my bike must uh, must be half, at least half the weight of yours. I feel like I'm cheating, really. But th- this whole <laughs> trip is about proving that cycling, anyone can cycle in any way that they wish. And if you can, if we can go the same speed, which we clearly are, you on your um, on your battleship and me on my uh, carbon fibre racing bike, um, well, why not? But why have you chosen to ride that particular bike? Well, because this is the low route, isn't it? What we're doing. This is the, you know, this isn't the, this isn't. We're not kind of like, we. we at no point did we pass over a little line in the tarmac, and a, and a transponder on our bike went beep. That didn't happen, right? So we're not. No one's timing us. No one's watching. You know, um, I loved it when you when you said let's go and do this thing. You know, the first word that sprung to mind was pootling. I wanted to pootle. Mm. So instantly, when I pootle, and most of my, almost all of my riding now is pootling. To be perfectly honest with you, I've kind of like. But I'm bored of no I never did measure myself but I'm really not doing it now so instantly that implies to me well a comfortable saddle so I've got a creaky old Brooks leather saddle that, and it implies a different clothing choice you know so I'm not I'm not wearing lycra I'm just wearing normal normal clothes and you're carrying luggage. I mean, you're in a car. Your you're, you're carrying my luggage. Yeah, <laughs> you're sat here. I'm. I've come really minimal. I'm in. Uh, I've just got a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. Um, you've got a, a corduroy jacket and some jeans and a and a flat cap. I mean, th- I'm doing this wrong, frankly. But um, I think maybe. Well, when we get to Southwold, I'm going to be posting everything that I'm carrying that you're carrying for me <laughs> back home, so you won't have to carry it back oh, nice. at, at least. Rafa, adventure starts anywhere. Thank you to Rafa for sponsoring the cycling podcast all year round and enabling us to launch this inaugural series of Explore. I think it's going well enough to think that we'll be back with Series 2 in 2019, Hannah. I hope so. I've definitely enjoyed doing it anyway. 
Well, that's the most important thing. Well, you've heard to my shame that I asked Ned and Simon to carry my luggage from Cambridge to Suffolk and back. Um, perhaps if Rafa's waterproof bar pack and frame packs had been available back in June, uh, not that I'd have needed them to be waterproof uh, for that particular trip because the sun was shining, but it's nice to know that they are waterproof. But perhaps if they'd been available then, I could have carried my own stuff. The waterproof handlebar pack is uh, designed to carry your luggage whether you're going on a long distance ride or multi-day ride and uh, well the important thing to me is that it fits neatly to the bike because i was riding my quite nice carbon race bike and i don't want sort of panniers and and stuff swinging about i want the luggage to become integral to the bike yeah i think earlier this year or last year as soon as everyone started to see taylor finney leading the way with his own one that he has on his handlebars and going around everyone was like yeah it's pretty good so actually i really still want one so rafa if you're listening which you obviously are um that's two of uh, your very fine waterproof bar packs for the explore team please and if anyone out there would like to check out the range of explore luggage you can go to rafa.cc I've picked you up on your thing about there's no climbs and nobody timing anything because when we went over that railway bridge, you sprinted to try and get the the yeah. first king of the mountains on. It. You did, yeah. Well, there was well. So if we had it with us, I'd be now sitting in the polka dot jersey, I think, wouldn't I? Yeah. On you know first KOM of the day, and you'd be very much in the green jersey, I think, and and you'd have taken the stage win, and you'd be actually be in yellow as well because just on the outskirts of Bury St Edmunds, you'd lo- you you were telling me an amazing story about Graham Taylor. <laughs> And then, like, at the drop of a hat, you suddenly stopped the story and sprinted <laughs> for about 10 yards. And you, won, you won the sprint for the sign. Yeah. Um, so, well done, you. But even Barry St. Edmunds has a, a, a slight connection for you with your tour last year. Yeah, when I started doing my one-man sort of comedy theatrical experience thing that I'm doing again this year later on, um, the first place, the Bicology Tour, as, as it was known a couple of years ago, the first place I did it was in... Barry St Edmunds at the, I think it's called the Apex Theatre so yeah yes. but that's got more spiritual importance for me so this is a whole you know and Southwold means as I think we're going to find out isn't it it means a lot to you from your childhood and um, it's great isn't it I mean it's one of the nice things like, one of the nice things about getting old <laughs> or older is that you do lay down little without getting psychogeographical about it but you do lay down little markers of memory wherever you go and sometimes they'll be laying dormant. And, you know, this happens to me on the Tour de France quite often. That I've, I'll have forgotten about that hotel in the northwest of Saint-Étienne. And suddenly we'll pull off a slip road and I'll go, oh, hang on, hang on. Oh, yeah, no, 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 I remember now. Mm. And that, I was here, that that was the day that, you know, say, but Balocchi crashed or whatever, or, you know. Mm. And it'll all come flooding back and that'll trigger other memories. And I think it's not dissimilar when you just trundle through a landscape like we're doing now over the next few days. But isn't that the beauty of cycling and the freedom you get with a bike? I mean, if you, we're probably too old to have our whole lives mapped in a kind of football style heat map. For those who don't watch football, the graphic comes up showing you where the players have run on the pitch and you can see, oh, that guy spent most of the time in the centre circle, that guy spent most of the time in the six-yard box or whatever. If you had a heat map of your life mapped by cycling, I think that would be absolutely fascinating. And one of the things that is really interesting for me on this ride is that these are roads I've never ridden on i've never ridden from cambridge to southwold as we get into southwold there'll be a few roads i've ridden on Mm. when i was a kid but there's something about just seeing something just as you're going through the hamlets and the lanes and uh, i have to say simon's plotted a great route using modern technology we it would have taken a lot of effort in the old days with a map to pick a route as quiet as the one that we've enjoyed this evening only 50 kilometers but other than the (laughs) other than the (laughs) epic yeah well we've got a fair way to go and a fair way to come back but other than the bit coming out of cambridge on the main road it's been really really quiet um very little traffic it's been kind of perfect cycling really but you you mentioned your event in bury st edmunds you chose to ride from bury st edmunds to chelmsford the next day on your tour is is traveling by bike well i mean why do you do that you don't have to do that you could 
kind of take public transport or, or hire a car or whatever, why do you choose to ride? Well, I can't always ride between the venues, but when I can, when there's the slightest opportunity, and I remember doing it up in the northwest, and yeah, I do it, I do it as often as I can when the, when the mileage is short enough, uh, because I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, it's almost like I'm explaining stuff that I'm sure the listeners will understand and you understand as well. It's just the best headspace time, isn't it? You know, so on this ride today. You and I have probably spoken more in the couple of hours we've been on a bike than probably the rest of our association together. That's not something you can do. I don't know. You've just got to. You've got to make the time to do that. And and, and riding through the countryside is uh, is the, is the best headspace time there is, isn't it? Isn't that the best thing about it? There's, you can't do it. There's nothing else to do, and you can't do anything else. You can't be checking your phone or reading your emails or worrying about such and such. And you sort out. If a problem is a problem while you're cycling, then it's worth dealing with, I find. And yeah. if, it, if, if it kind of, oh, I can't be bothered to think about this now, it kind of puts it into, into perspective a little bit. Yeah, and, and, and it's a very detoxifying, I mean, we're into our third pint now, so it's not that detoxifying, but, uh, but it's um, mentally a detoxifying kind of process going on a, on a little ride like this, because especially if you're, we, as we are, all three of us, Simon as well, we're carrying our own stuff as we've alluded to. So I made a decision straight away to say, uh, do I need a laptop? I always carry my laptop. Everywhere I go, I have my laptop. Not not on this trip. I didn't want the extra what, four kilos or three kilos or whatever it weighs in my... So no laptop, no. The bear, You know, you kind of strip all that away. And that's that's been a really nice thing. That's what I'm looking forward to over the next couple of days as well. And um, you mentioned we're in the middle of the World Cup. Yeah. Um, and... Your bike is decorated with uh, with an England flag, um, and uh, this is an interesting one for me because, uh, well, uh, being being a, a, an Irish citizen as well as an England football supporter, um, I, I'm so conflicted about the the sort of the 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 the, the kind of political ramifications of the Cross of St George, but you said when we just ordered our beer there you think there's a positive benefit to carrying the england flag on your bike well it just occurred to me on our ride to i could be really careful i phrase this but it did it's just a seed of a thought and i wonder if it'll be you know um, more i'll garner more evidence on the road tomorrow but i i <laughs> i've got this funny feeling that uh, flying the england flag on the back of my bike and being passed did we have a close pass today in no. two hours? No, and a lot of the a lot of the close or a lot of the potential close passes or the the vehicles that could have been close passes were fitted into that kind of stereotype of the kind of vehicles. I'm talking about white vans, aren't I? That's what I'm talking about, right? So if there is a mythical white van man in Cambridgeshire and Suffolk today, um, uh, bless him, he gave us a very wide berth. And it just occurred to me, and I wondered, I wondered whether in the back of his mind, even subliminally, or her mind, but probably his, um, the England flag just kind of helped. So what about stage two tomorrow? What's the strategy now? Um, I mean, it's uh, Bury St Edmunds to Southwold. I mean, you've not looked at the course in advance, I assume. (laughs) Well, I, I, I would suggest tomorrow's a day where you, you can't necessarily win the, the Cambridge Southwold Cambridge semi classic but you can certainly lose it <laughs> <laughs> I'm just slightly concerned I just wanted to ask you what you've done with your because as you said you're travelling light aren't you you're, mm. yeah and I'm, I'm so the t-shirt and the shorts you're wearing I've been carting them around like they're fresh on and everything and that's great the kit you were wearing today What's what, what's happened with that? What's it's been uh, washed in shower wash in the very very weak lukewarm shower. So Are you um, confident it's going to dry in time. I, I think it's going to dry in time. What I'm not confident is that I got all the soap out of it, and so um, when it get when I get a bit sweaty mid morning, I could be frothing a bit. We're <laughs> <laughs> lying of frothing. That's quite a yeah. well. It'd be part of the course, wouldn't you? Frothing Sorry. with indignation about yeah. something, or, or literally frothing yeah. from the backside. Yeah. yeah. I, th- I think kind of uh, British hotel chain body wash will be uh, seeping out of the out of the jersey I'm wearing. This is producer Tom in my shed. You can hear the rain. It's grim out there today. Now, when it comes to bike packing adventures. You've got to get your strategy right when it comes to packing your kit. Now, Lionel's option, as we heard in this episode, is to 
courier stuff back home from the halfway point, but this only really works for out and back two day events. It is not a strategy that's going to get you through the Transcontinental or the Indy Pack. Later on, you'll also hear Lionel getting Simon to carry his gear for him. Now, that's a luxury that's only afforded to team leaders like Lionel. The rest of us don't have the luxury of an army of Gregarios. Now, you may think that Lionel and James Hayden, the winner of the transcontinental race for the past two years, don't have much in common as bike riders. But they do share a philosophy when it comes to planning bikepacking adventures. For example, take James's take on accommodation. Hotels or bivvy bag by the side of the road? Hotel every night. <laughs> I, like, I like a bit of luxury. Now, James's key to packing is to keep it simple, but be ready for every weather eventuality. Everything is this year was by Rafa. So I had the saddle bag, the frame bag, like the big frame bag, because I put a camelback uh, like bladder in there. Then it's essentially from head down because there's not much else. It's, it's like helmet, hat, glasses, sunglasses, merino buff thing for my face, rain jacket, kind of thermal jacket, the flyweight thing for when it's really hot during the day, gloves, uh, two pairs of boot shorts. I like to change them halfway through the race. Leg warmers with some like real nice high vis on the back. Socks, one just one pair is fine. Uh, shoes and then rain over shoes. Uh, you know, then I have like some sun cream, uh, moisturising lip balm because my lips get really really chapped and it's horrible one of the key things when you're going on a bike packing adventure or you're doing one of these ultra endurance races is not to overpack so what not to take it might surprise you and gross you out a little bit to hear one of the items that James Hayden leaves behind in order to save just that little bit more weight and space I don't take a toothbrush <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah why? <laughs> yeah no <laughs> No, there's no need for a toothbrush. So yeah, don't just don't take one. As well as luxuries not to take, you have to consider the luxuries that you absolutely have to take. Richard Abraham also rode the TCR in 2018, although he abandoned the race somewhere in Hungary. For him, music is an essential accompaniment to any long distance ride. But in France, it's actually illegal to ride with your headphones in. Um, and then I had a portable speaker on my stem hooked up with Bluetooth to my iPod, which was pretty much always in my back pocket. On the face of it, that looked like a luxury, but that was I wouldn't do it without that because having music and having something to listen to and something to just sort of take your mind off riding your bike for 18 hours a day at least um, was essential, really. Like James, Richard stresses the need to pack for every kind of weather eventuality, wind, rain, the changes in temperature, particularly between night and day. An ultra-distance bike race will reveal a lot of things about you as a person, but without fail, it will also reveal the items that you really didn't need to take with you. For Richard, that item was a mug, which he'd intended to use to eat out of whenever necessary. But then I quickly realised that most food comes in a thing anyway. You could just eat it from that thing, whether it's like a can or a bag. (laughs) And, you know, you kind of lose any sense of personal dignity when you smell like you smell after you've been riding for that long the idea of having i mean when you eat something out of like a camping mug it's hardly it's hardly like etiquette if there's not much difference to eating it out of a can or eating it out of a bag anyway i'm talking like you know a can of beans or like porridge oats and some milk you know everything comes in a sealed vessel these days so you can you can make do with that (laughs) <laughs> the mug went into a bin in a uh, service station in Austria somewhere when I, when I was feeling pretty low. And I, obviously that would have made a huge amount of difference to the amount of weight <laughs> in my bag. Unlike James, Richard does advise taking a toothbrush, but he also advises that you do not do what he did with his. I, I was quite proud that I'd cut off my toothbrush. So cut off the, the most of the handle of a toothbrush. I saw a guy doing that at the start in Belgium, you know, a few hours before the race, he got out his his pocket knife and started cutting his toothbrush off i felt very smug because obviously i'd already done that and i thought that's what you had to do because you know a couple of grams and a bit of space saved don't do it <laughs> that would be a, a a bit of advice to somebody thinking of doing it it just it just meant that whenever i brushed my teeth i didn't have a handle on my toothbrush and i just got toothpaste all over my hands so that's your guide to what to take on a bike packing adventure or an ultra endurance ride or just a poodle from Cambridge to South Walden back. But now you've got your kit sorted, you need to think about your fueling strategy. Science in sport. Before you hit the wall, hit back. A lot of the time I'm 
you know, as a chef, you're looking for something that with, with, a, with a little bit of savouriness to it. Hi, my name's Hayden Groves. I rode all three Grand Tours last year in 2017. Yeah, that's the Giro d'Italia, Tour de France, and Vuelta Espana. Total distance of just over 10,400 kilometers. Not only did I do that, I'm also an ambassador for science in sport. And at the same time, I raised over a hundred thousand pounds for the charity Cure Leukemia. You know, millions of pounds have been put in to develop these products from a scientific perspective, but you do want to sort of gravitate towards a flavor or flavors that you enjoy. And um, certainly my, my, myself, I'd, I'd take a handful of um, gels or bars and I would almost strategically look to, to my favorite gel and I'd think, right, I'm gonna have that. I'm, you know, I'm going for a bit of a Strava on this climb. I'd have that towards the last 5k, you know, and look forward to it. I know it's a, a bit sad, but you'd think, you know, you have your, your, your least favourable flavours and, and then move to, you, you know, a flavour that you really enjoy and that's it. I'm really going to go, uh, you know, for a crowd pleaser there. You know? And it's almost like a placebo effect. Thank you to Science in Sport for sponsoring the cycling podcast and this series of Explore. If you would like to get 25% off all of their products, go to scienceinsport.com and when you check out, enter the code SISCP25. Whether you're riding a long way or a short way, they will have something to keep you nice and fed and watered. <laughs> Stage two, Ned. Yes. It's a big one, isn't it? Tops out at... Um well, over 53 miles, I think, whatever that is in kilometres. 80-something, 80 85 yeah. maybe, something like that. A big day. But the biggest day will obviously be the third day tomorrow. Let's not think. One day at a time. One like, stage at a time. One stage at a time. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. You worried about the climbing today? No, not particularly. <laughs> it's lovely, isn't it? It was surprisingly hilly yesterday because you'd sold us this myth of, like, this will be the flattest thing you've ever experienced. Mm. Um, it's all relative. And there were, there were mild inclines to deal with yesterday, which um, I exploited. Yeah, well, we, that was Cambridgeshire. We're now into Suffolk. Suffolk. Yeah. Um, I think today is going to be pretty flat. You, you, you were looking on your wind app to see whether we were going to have any help from the wind or not. Well, we've got this high-pressure system that's moved in at in, in, in the end of June now, and uh, so that means that the wind is coming in from the east, from the continent, from, from Russia basically so we're going to battle a very very mild headwind as we head east now and then that'll be hopefully at our backs for the big one on stage three for the queen stage are we going to call it the queen stage tomorrow's got to be the queen stage hasn't it yeah. we the race organizer has really backloaded the difficulty with the longest <laughs> stage last maybe we should have a little crit tomorrow evening in, in cambridge just around the train station <laughs> or time trial <laughs> what a great yeah. idea what a great idea yeah um I don't know about you, but there's something quite liberating about uh, this. Is this is kind of you've literally uh, got a water carrier? I here. have. I know. I feel terribly guilty that you two are carrying my luggage. I'm not not guilty enough to offer to carry it myself. But <laughs> just, so, just, so, just so the listeners know, just before we actually started recording this section, you literally said to Simon, the photographer, you said to Simon, um, "Simon, we got this thing to do. Can you go and get the, some water?" <laughs> Because we're doing quite important podcast stuff, so can you just run in and fill up the water bottles? I don't think you even said please, actually, but off he went. I'm used to it. Th thank you, Simon, for filling up the water <laughs> for us. Um, oh, I feel terrible. Or, did, or Didier, as we're now going to call him. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes from Framlingham. Maybe a bit more. I'm conscious we're going to pay for this effort, Ned. Well, it was perhaps in retrospect. We'll see how it plays out, Lionel, but I, th I know what you're saying. In hindsight, it might have been naive of us. We got sucked into the race there. There was no needs. We could have played it different. We could have just set, you know, worked together, but I'm not sure the cohesion was really there. We, for a while, there was a Chris Froome-style attack a la Giro, wasn't there? And you and I were cast in the role of Tom Dumoulin and Thibaut Pino. Um, and it didn't, it didn't, it, in the end, he had to sit up and wait for us. It was humiliating, really, wasn't it? It was, especially for me. Um, I'm carrying no luggage, as I keep mentioning. No luggage boy. <laughs> no luggage boy. But yeah, you probably didn't hear my commentary, my attempt at live in-race commentary. Oh, no. I nicknamed you the flag bearer of Bedford. <laughs> dancing on the pedals in your flat-soled suede cycling <laughs> shoes. <laughs> it's quite... My sand shoes It's a... Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good look. It's a strong look, I think, is, is how people would describe it. Yeah, whether or not the flag still f remains fluttering in the wind tomorrow kind of depends on how Southgate's boys perform against the might of Panama. 
Well, today... But, but, and, and with that in mind... We, um, we do need to press on, but I was just going to say, today we were... Well, yesterday we passed where the Tour de France stage started in Cambridge. You pointed out the, the park where there was the, the big start of the Cambridge-London yeah. stage. And this morning, we, as we rolled out of Bury St Edmunds, we went through the main square there, I don't know what it's called, where I think it's hosted the women's tour twice. It was the first finish, I think, in 2015, whenever that was, and there was a start there as well, more recently. And we're 10 minutes from Framlingham, where a stage of the women's tour started a couple of weeks ago, and we're finishing today in Southwold, where the yeah. women's tour stage finished. It's like, a, it's like we're checking off uh, significant cycling places of the last 10 years in the east of England. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we also stopped for a photograph in Southgate Lane, and it's yeah. the day England play Panama, and, and that, to me, seems like an omen. And I think we should probably just briefly explain the reason for your England flag isn't just a burst of English soccer patriotism. It's because you obviously used to work with the current England manager, Gareth Southgate. Yeah, I did for a few years. When he um, uh, stopped being a manager at Middlesbrough, he went into punditry when I was still covering football and the Champions League. So I spent lots of weeks away with Gareth Southgate one way and the other and got to know him. And he was some... He stood out as a markedly different kind of character from a lot of the ex-players. Um, and uh, I, I, and uh, we used to go running together. We used to like walking. So we spent a lot of hours in each other's company. Now, I've kind of lost contact with him over the, you know, obviously he's got the England job, you know, and haven't seen him for a few years. But about a week before the World Cup started, I decided I'd send him an email just to say that I thought that the way that, uh, that his young players and the England team kind of presented themselves and everything was that did Gareth a great deal of credit. And I kind of like, I, I saw him reflected in their openness and their... Um, Anyway, so I sent him a long email reminiscing about this, that and the other, and basically just wishing him good luck. And I contained within the email a white lie. I said, I have pinned a little England flag to my bike in support of your team. Not thinking that I'd get a reply from him, frankly, because he's got a World Cup to win. Next day, I got a long email back from him. That it was very nice and finished with, um, I hope we can make you proud of your little flag on your bike. And I thought, ah, <laughs> I better go and get one then. So I, got, I went to one of those crappy um, tourist stalls on Oxford Street and paid £2.99 for that flag, which I've pinned on my bike. And the next day I found that uh, WH Smiths were selling two for 20p. <laughs> anyway, ever since we... then, I've, I've thrown it with, um, with pride, and I'm going to continue to do that come uh, hell or high water. Because, to cut a long story short, I remember Euro 96, and that, I think that was the last time that everybody across the swathe in England kind of embraced the flag. And I think since then it's become quite a divisive mm. symbol. So this is part of me trying to reclaim it a bit. So here we are on the Cambridge Southwell Cambridge Classic, but you're um, deep in preparation for the Tour de Ned. I well, I should be. Shouldn't be out riding this. Really, I should be slaving over you know my desk trying to invent gags. I've written a bit. So the the, the third year of my one man comedy theatrical extravaganza national tour thing, um, I thought I'd better write some totally new material and um, strip it down to what people really care about, which I think is the Tour de France. So I'm waiting to see whatever happens on this year's Tour de France, because something's going to happen, isn't it? A bus is going to crash into something, you know, an inflatable arch will collapse on something, and, you know, something daft will happen almost every day, because uh, that's the fascination of the race. And then I'm going to kind of try and recreate it on stage. So, um, and, and with, you know, digressions and diversions and little dips into history and a lot of fun... <coughs> Whoa, there's a gate just closing in the background. Um, a lot of fun, and, and, and the idea is to have a right old laugh, but also relive uh, the action in July in a kind of daft theatrical style, but that's it, yeah. When's the tour start, and will you be riding between any of the venues? Yes, yeah, some of them are close enough, some of them aren't. Uh, the tour gets underway probably while you're listening to this podcast, so late September gets underway, and then all of October and November I'm on the road. Conveniently... 21 venues, so it's the 21 stages of uh, the Tour de Ned. And how many rest days? Uh, enough, just about. But <laughs> oh, Lionel, it's such a wonderful, nerve wracking, weird life doing that. But, um, but yeah, yeah. Well, we did something similar but on a much smaller scale with the cycling podcast. Yeah. And I remember talking to you around the time that we were doing that tour. I had this vision that because the events are in the evening and all we had to do is sort of travel oh there'll be so much time I'm going to be inventing time to do other things but you just can't because everything is fixated on that evening's event and what you're going to say and uh, the kind of the nerves of appearing in front of a crowd you must still yeah. even though you've done a couple of years of these you must still get those nerves I get, I get 
I, I get extremely nervous every time I'm locked on it's a one man show so I'm, I've only got me really and my wonderful stage manager on whom I rely but he's busy doing stuff up up on the stage talking to the theatre technicians and once they open the house so it's, I'm getting all the lingo you see now you know once the house is open um, I'm locked into my my um, changing room, my green room and I, I can't come out really so I'm just on my own obviously with my extravagant rider you know which features oh, yeah. all sorts of you know wild what's things. in your rider bananas and water yeah. um, and and I'm just listening to they all have these little funny little tannoy speakers in green rooms through which they can make announcements to you but basically you hear the ambient noise of the theatre filling up so you kind of get this hubbub of anticipation and it's all you've got to, you've got to go out and do it and until you kind of you know you've done the first gag and people like it and they mm. kind of uh, you can't really relax and then it's great then it's just a load of fun Oh, that hubbub, that's uh, making the butterflies in my yeah. stomach, just the memory of it. Um, every night, never quite knowing whether it's going to be okay. And it's a bit like cycling in that sense. Some, you have good days and bad days. Some days it just bit. flows and other, yeah. other nights not so much. Talking about butterflies in your stomach, you, you complaining a bit earlier you got a touch of the Tom Dumoulin's kicking off. Mm. How's it? Mm. How's that? I think it might be the, the sausage and bacon bap. Um, just uh, sausage and bacon bap for revenge. Yeah, might need to go and uh, do a demoulin. 30 kilometres to Southwold? Uh, roughly, yes. I think, yeah, we're going to make it in good time. Um, but we're going to take the pace off a bit. Definitely. Um, definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're. Couple of hours, couple of hours, I think. Two hours? No. Well, just bimbling, bimbling. Yeah, but bimbling. Countryside. Bimbling. Is that, is that over bimbling? Bimbling is 25k an hour. Right. Pressing on is 30 plus k an hour. I'd, I'd argue that's 20 miles an hour. There was too much. 20. I think there was too much pressing on earlier in the day for my taste. So did I just? I've written off. Did, did I just heard the word bimbling getting used. Mm, bimbling is a great word. It's a great word. Um, but even if we bimble, we're still going to. We're still going to be in very good time. We've got to get the ferry from Walberswick to, to Southwold. This kind of riding's all about. Bimbling, jumping on little ferries, ice cream, lager shandy. Yeah. Chips. Burger, Burger and, chips. and chips, yeah. 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 <laughs> Ned, are you, what, you have a, the, the, bolting, the bolting-ometer rating of churches. Well, just, it's just started. That's fantastic, isn't it? I think it's St Andrews. Yep. In, uh, what's this place called? Do you know this place? Walberswick. Walberswick. And it's built of... Um, so it's built onto the ruins of a 15th century abbey that used to be there before it. And um, I don't know when the church was built, but it looks pretty ancient to me. And it's it's all made of that of this Suffolk flintstone, isn't it? Which yeah. is just... Um, you get that bit in Sussex as well, don't you? Mm. Um, but kind of... Yeah, just... Uh, it, it, it's, it's a special... It's just special, isn't it? And on a day like this, it's... Um, remarkable place. Eventually we reached Walberswick and we could see Southwold just across the other side of the River Blythe. The only way across without taking a big detour was to get in the little boat and for a pound apiece we were able to put our bikes in the boat and cross the water. Really like that one. Really, really like that one. Happy Ned? Very happy. How long's the crossing run? Uh, I think it's about an hour and a quarter. Is it? Yeah. Depending on which way is the, the casino. <laughs> yeah. What's this river called? Blythe. 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 Yeah. The technical bit here, like. Yeah, yeah, coming into. What is it? Mooring. Mooring, isn't it? Parking. Oh, I've got sea legs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a bit this wobbly. Is, this, is <laughs> this is moving. Yeah, this is moving now. Um, <laughs> oh, cheers! Cheers! Cheers, quite, Ned. Quite of um, Adnams mm. Southwold bitter. Mm. What did you make of stage two? I thought it was wonderful. I thought it was um, it was uh, it was uh, well, it was interesting tactically, wasn't it? I thought it was the dynamics in the in the group in the final sort of like you know push for the line. I thought we got a bit ragged, didn't we? There was a bit of lack of cooperation. There's occasional lulls in the action, then a little full, that, that soft attacks. You know, there was a little bit of um, I think particularly between you and me actually between Dumoulin and Pino, mm. 
There was Someone a... even went on the pavement for a brief section. Oh right? yes, an unfortunate disqualification, Ned, for going on the pavement. Well, but you can still start tomorrow. Well, and quite rightly, really, because you know you think about. I'd, I'd obviously, honestly have to put the point the finger at the um, organisation a little bit. A, a van appeared in front of me on the road, <laughs> which is not. You know, I had to take evasive action, Lionel. Yeah. You know, yeah. we'll smart work, move though. To we'll, be fair, we'll work on closed roads for next year. <laughs> if we if we can raise uh, raise money, but this is a pleasant spot, isn't it, Southwold? Yeah, it's it's as, as I remember it, I mean, it's, there's a lot of people here enjoying a weekend trip. Yeah, tell think. me about your your um, connection that you know you didn't really explain it. I don't think. No. Um, we well, when I was a kid, we used to come here during sort of half term holidays uh, a number of years in a row. I th- I think from memory, um, and the reason for that was my dad was and still is a keen bird watcher and Minsmere Nature Reserve is just down the road. So we would come here, um, we'd stay here. He's a, a fan of Adnam's Ale as well, so I think it's, uh, it ticked a few boxes. And um, my memories of coming here are the, the stony beach and the, the beach huts. So we'd go to Minsmere and, you know, being a kind of sporty kid, it was hard, um, it sometimes tested my patience sitting in the hides being quiet and still looking for things that I couldn't readily see and didn't really inherit the the bird watching interest but obviously the, the twitching no yeah. no it doesn't no, I mean I like birds <clears throat> and, and, and and wildlife and stuff but don't feel the need to go out and look for it with binoculars last time I rode well, last time I ran a marathon I didn't even wear a watch I just went naked not naked, obviously, but, you know, t- in terms of t- telemetry. <laughs> naked telemetry. You'd rather not know? Sometimes it's better not to know, isn't it? Mm. I mean, it's always good to have someone who knows with you so that you're not entirely floundering. But we've got Simon, he knows all sorts. And also, he's quite good at my bike, isn't he? We've just found out. So we've stopped. Uh, I mean, uh, it's just an oasis that's appeared from nowhere. It's essentially an enormous industrial estate in the middle of nowhere in Suffolk that appears to have a um, absolutely fantastic cafe that's open and is serving what looks like lovely coffees and breakfast and mm. Lionel it could not have come <laughs> at a better time it's quarter to ten in the morning we've been riding for a couple of hours now and we were just beginning to find I'd, I'd gone I'd just, I'd just gone over the top we came on back onto the mainish road and it's been rolling for a fair while and Simon's been setting a sort of 20 mile an hour pace and on that longish drag I just lost the will to hold the wheel Yeah. thinking there's not going to be a cafe <laughs> until we get to Cambridge well we're going, <laughs> we're going through these tiny little villages mm. hoping that there'd be something and there wasn't but then there was a but then you two stiffed me because we passed a quite a way back we passed a burger van that was open and I dinged my bell as if to say let's let's go and get a burger <laughs> and you went oh Ned <laughs> rather sniffily really and I went well they'll do us a bacon bap but by the time we'd actually had this discussion we'd already rolled a couple of hundred yards past the turning and the moment had gone we also it was a roadside place basically a sort of um uh what a kind of a it was a just, a van, just a van, yeah, really, yeah. <clears throat> and um, we realised we didn't really have enough cash between us. Yeah, so there, there was that. The first question we asked when we got here was, "Do you take cards?" Well, I was. I've, I've run this scenario through before. If you don't take cards, I'll leave you my mobile number. You can, you know, it's just even something like, "Well, just see that I'm a real person on yeah. Twitter." You know, look, that's me on Twitter. Just send me a, send me a tweet. A pu- you copy me into a tweet saying you owe me £10.50 for breakfast. And then I'll get in touch afterwards and I'll do a bank transfer. It's crossed my mind. that I've, I've or, or, or I can't pay for my sandwich, but I can give you a free Friends of the Podcast subscription for a year. Imagine that. People would... That'd be a ma- what, really? I'd be able to have seconds of the value of that, surely. <laughs> so, are we all still having fun? Do you want the honest answer? Not really. I don't think I do, no. <laughs> no, I, I am. I'm just having a few kilometres of self-doubt. Watching you effectively interval training behind a van on your, <laughs> on your bike, with, uh, which is heavy, uh, and you're out the saddle sprinting after it, and I can't follow. 
Yeah. You, no, it's because you hesitated. You would have been fine if you'd just gone at the right moment. Then you're in the, mm. you're in the, you're on the van, and it was great. It's great fun, huh? But we know, we know from covering cycling that if you hesitate, it's because it's you, you haven't got it. Well, it's not for me to say, is it, Lionel? Don't don't plague yourself with self doubt. There's no yeah. point. It's not a race, is it? True. True. How's morale? Yeah, good. I think it's good now, don't you? Mm. I think we've I think we've broken the back of this thing. Yeah. Beast, this massive. This. Do you know how far we've gone? No, but we've already been over this, haven't we, Lionel? I prefer to ride in a cocoon of blissful ignorance. Ignorance is strength, as George Orwell said in 1984. And I need all the strength I can muster. Well, you're riding very strongly. I, I feel like this this is testing me. It's a long while since I've ridden this sort of distance. Yeah, but- Actually, people may not know this line. Well, I certainly didn't know it until we started this ride together a couple of days ago. You used to race a bit. You were a racer. No. Not. You could have been a contender. No, certainly not. Third and fourth cat races. That's a race. Yes. A race is a race. Pin on a number and it's a race. Did you ever, did you ever, for example, finish in fourth place at Hillingdon in a third cat race? Uh, I did. Yeah, I thought you had. Rulers, uh, Ian Cleverly can testify to that because he lent me a water bottle it's a, a creditable ride and, and did you did you ever manage a seventh place in a uh, was it a fourth cat race as yeah. well, that, yeah. well I, I did actually yeah, yeah. yeah finished on a little hill yeah. and i carried uh, my natural ballast <laughs> down the descent and uh got into a bit of an aero tuck and uh, caught a few people by surprise on the final rise to the line i was never troubling the winners but Hey, it's great fun. Racing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you do quite a bit down on the track at Hilling, um, at Hearn Hill. A little bit, yeah, messing around. I get progressively worse at it, but I do, I do enjoy it. And I, I think it's kind of important that you draw a distinction in cycling between riding and racing because they're two different things, aren't they? Yeah. And I think sometimes people forget that. Um, and uh, and I think if listen, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I barely ever. I barely ever race, and even then, it's only around the track. Um, I do a fair amount of riding, but I, I do think that people who've only ever ridden in inverted commas, and maybe they've you know tested themselves in sportees and all that sort of thing, and done rides like we're doing, should you know I really would encourage them if they can to, to to have a crack at pinning a number on and just see how you know you can always drop out the back. There's no harm in that, and you probably will to be yeah. fair. But um. Because well, you, you drop out the back a lot more than you don't, unless you're, you know, exactly. very good. Yeah, exactly. I've worked out, you know, 142 different ways of losing and almost none of winning, you know. <laughs> so. But I think you're right. I mean, this is a, this is effectively a social ride, isn't it, this? Um, but we've had some moments when we've been pushing on a bit. We've had too many moments when we've pushed on. We've all been guilty of it, haven't we? Mm. You just now, a little soft attack. Just when, in fact, there was a bit of Chris Froome bluffage going on there, wasn't there? We thought you were suffering a bit. Yeah, and then, I. And then a little bit of a rolling terrain there. You just, yeah. you just, it wasn't, it wasn't an attack, was it? You just kind of drifted off the front, and all of a sudden you were five, six seconds up the road, and it was, yeah. it's quite hard to close a gap on you. <laughs> I think the thing is, without trying to equate going for a 90-mile bike ride with <laughs> riding the Tour de France, it, it's when I do something like this that it reminds me just what a mental game it is um, because you can feel quite good one minute and then terrible and then you get another little burst and uh, I suppose it's about learning over the years what you're good at and what you're bad at I know where I'm weaker and so I sort of back off a bit yeah. and then force you, force you two to slow down and wait for me so, so it's, a, it's a foxy ride there. Well, yeah it's wily isn't it <laughs> wily Wiley. Wiley NNL. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> He's slipped his gears and that's the moment to accelerate. <laughs> After all the. Well, it's just the contrast, isn't it? Yeah. Home advantage there, Ned. Oh. Gets you the win. Wow. Well, bit know. of gamesmanship in the final, wasn't there? A bit of looking yeah. at each other. Yeah. I noticed at one point Simon pulling on my England flag to try and slow me up <laughs> with about 100 metres to go, but. I'm delighted to take the first win in the inaugural. I mean, it'll go down in the history books now. Mm. I am. I'm uh, Maurice Garin, aren't mm. I, in a way? So, in summary, stage three. Ah, oh, it was beautiful. Honestly, there were points that I think I turned to you at one point, just as we were kind of like south of Newmarket and deep into 
bumpy, lumpy Cambridgeshire as we crossed the border, um, where I said, is, it, is everyone, it's one of those science fiction films where everyone has been lifted onto, you know, uplifted by aliens or they all died mysteriously because we just stopped seeing people and cars for yeah. about half an hour. It was wonderful. Some of the villages were stunning, weren't they? Yeah. The thatched roofs. I don't know about the, the economics or the fire safety standards of thatch roof something else for me to research uh, before we put the final edit together we'll add it to our list of things about which we know very little <laughs> what have we done we've done nuclear power nuclear yeah. fission didn't know anything about that still talked about it endlessly um, the thames barge which you did know about little bit tiny little grain of knowledge yeah. that you know um football we talked endlessly about oh, football about too, which too we don't much. Know much um too much maybe and, uh, yeah no that was just great and we got lucky with the weather but it was just I don't know how you feel about it. Is everything it was supposed to be, right? It was yeah, I think cool. so. I mean, the, the cycling was fantastic. It was challenging enough. Um, I had a dodgy spell with an hour to go. Yeah. And I thought, I don't feel great. Maybe the heat. Uh, the heat plays havoc. <laughs> Takes two weeks, apparently, to acclimatise to Cambridge. significant... Yeah, to Cambridgeshire <laughs> heat, yeah. Um, but no, it was wonderful. And uh, the sausage and and bacon bap Propelled this morning it way. made it really it, it, it that really helped us yeah. um so yeah thanks for coming oh, on the the cambridge southwold cambridge yeah. that's you know once once we spread the word there'll probably be a thousand entrants next year so from lionel's low route to connor dunn and larry warbass's no-go tour they had a hashtag we we didn't have a hashtag but next year we'll we'll get trending on twitter I can't believe that that didn't warrant having a hashtag, actually. Definitely was an oversight there. I was too worried that people would take the mickey out of how few kilometres or miles we were riding. Well, but like you said, it's all about the enjoyment of it. And uh, and so when I uh, actually spoke to Larry and Connor... Um, they obviously spoke a lot about how they did little things or there were little quirks that maybe wound each other up a little bit. But Larry also actually goes quite, uh, talks quite deeply about how well he got to know Connor uh, through those hours and hours and hours spent on the bike because it really gives you a lot of time to chat and talk to each other. And that's, I guess, what you and Ned found as well when you were on yours. Yeah, um, it did. Yeah, I think that's the thing about cycling, isn't it? You can't really do anything else when you're out there. You're concentrating on the road ahead and just there's a lot of time to talk and get to know people yeah and i think that that's the thing there's a kind of a real depth to friendships that you have when you develop them on the bike and it's good to hear that with larry and connor as well well next year lionel's low route well the route will be announced in january i'm gonna i'm, I'm committed to it now aren't i but and the event will be in june i think um i'm actually going to wait and see where the women's tour goes because the original plan was to try and ride to the finish of the stage of the women's tour but um, ned wasn't available on that day unfortunately so we had to we had to reschedule the Cambridge Southworld Cambridge Classic anyway this is uh, Connor Dunn the Irish national champion and Larry Warbass former US national champion both of whom are more used to riding in the world tour talking about their no-go tour first this is Connor Dunn I think the best day for me was probably the day after the outdoors stage so I think that was stage like I call it stages day five I think or no six Hi, my name's Connor Dunn and I am one half of the no-go tour. Around about then, but it was when we went up Col Daniel, which is um, one of the high passes um, into Italy. And I think that was kind of my favourite climb, so it kind of made it the, the highlight, I think. It was just an unreal, unreal uh, climb. And it was a nice moment for me because I think we got to the point where we were both so tired. We were kind of like slogging up this climb in like our own little world and just... Um, I kind of just being right in the moment, I guess. It was a, it was cool. I'd have to really go back and think about it, but we had just an awesome time. Hi, my name is Larry Warbass. I'm from Traverse City, Michigan, and I'm the better half of the no-go tour. The last day was probably the worst because I was the most sad because uh, I actually didn't want it to end. So the first seven days were, were incredible. The eighth day was as well, but I was just a little bit down that, that it was all ending. I think I learned, well, I kind of knew he was very competitive. <laughs> And I think that just shone through a bit more. He, he just loves pushing himself. I learned how fit he was as well because he made me suffer. So, yeah, it was pretty impressive to see, actually. Um, and he was also very selfless. Um, he just kind of wanted to share the experience with me, you know. And you could see, like, let's not beat around the bush. He was struggling with me on the climbs. But uh, he would he would always kind of, like, 
want to kind of get up together and he'd like help me through and like he'd force me to eat and things like this and I think there could have been a point where he kind of cracked with me and was like well you just hurry up Connor and he never really he never did that you know we kept it kept it to himself I learned a lot but I, I'd have to say like the most the biggest thing was just like so I've been teammates with Connor for two years now and you know right when he first moved to Nice uh, we started training together all the time because he lived just around the corner from me and just to see how he's like grown as a person and a rider has been like so cool um, because I mean the thing that I've seen the most and I, I mean I know this is like really serious and stuff but uh, <laughs> uh, and maybe the no-go tour was like a light-hearted thing but he's just grown so much as like a person and more what I mean I guess is like in his mental fortitude is like now he's like such a fighter and he's so strong and uh in, in the head, I mean, you know, he's, he's also strong on the bike. In the Vuelta last year, I was only there the first week because I crashed out at the end, but he was, like, really struggling, and, you know, he broke down. Like, one day in the bus, he, he broke down, actually, in tears. I hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying that uh, because it was just, like, so hard, and, and, you know, he was really struggling. But, but you know, I guess we all kind of tried to give him a pep talk, and, you know, I was rooming with him at the time, and so I really... The one thing, I like... like it's funny because he's bigger than me, but he's almost like my little brother. And then I'm always like trying to give him these talks and pep talks and, you know, you know, talk him through things. And so we were rooming together and, you know, I was just always trying to talk him through things. And, you know, we all are suffering in these races and it's so hard. And so, you know, I guess I've just, I've given him a lot of pep talks over the years and it's been really cool to see how much he's grown mentally and as a person, just also since the no-go tour to see how he's fought uh, to get a team. And now he's found one. And, you know, that, that was a huge huge thing because I know for a while he was really losing faith there and uh, it's just yeah it's awesome to see so he's just grown so much mentally and and that's really cool I guess I wasn't ever really that worried for him but it was more I was just worried he was gonna stop trying and that was the one thing I just kept telling him he couldn't do you know like like he had to you know he couldn't just it was like a few weeks there like right when the team folded and then maybe a little bit after the no-go tour and stuff and he'd like you know he'd get really down and he'd start talking I was just like (laughs) you cannot do this, you know, like, you can't, you can't give up, like, you've worked too hard for this, like, you've got to keep trying, and and if I didn't believe in him, and if I didn't think he could do an amazing job, I wouldn't tell him that, you know, I'd say, yeah, maybe you should find a new job, (laughs) but no, like, he, he he has what it takes, and and he's, like, an incredible teammate, an incredible guy, and I'm not just saying that, because he's my friend, but he, he is, he, he's, he's, He's awesome, and I know his new team's going to be so thrilled to have him. And and so yeah, I'm just uh, yeah. I, I guess I wasn't ever really that worried, even if he might have been. So to be honest, we got along pretty well. Like the whole seven days. I'm trying to think. He probably said that I pushed him a bit too much or something. But, but I'd like to hear what his response was. But I guess we'll wait for the podcast for that one. Uh, the annoying thing, he was always dawdling in the mornings. <laughs> Take like ages to get out the door. I think I dawdled on the rides, but he always dawdled, like, b- before leaving. <laughs> so he was always trying to get him out of the door, and then boards were out the door, we away. He'll probably say the same about me, but... Okay, at first I got mad because he kept stopping to take photos and stuff like that, you know? And, and, and I was like, okay, if you're not dropped, you can take photos and videos and everything like that. But if, if you're, like, three minutes behind, you better not be taking photos and, you know, making videos about me dropping you and, and like, because... You know, you you gotta crack on, but uh, but yeah, that was maybe the only thing that that I got a bit annoyed with, or the time that we went swimming, and he was so slow to move everywhere any day. He was oh, you know, like dragging a little bit, and then all of a sudden, like we got to Lake Annis, and he wanted to go swimming. It was like we got back, and he just like got changed. Like let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go swimming. And I was like, where where has this been the whole time? You know, oh, I also got mad at him and helped us because because uh, he just was like you know, dragging the whole day. He's like, oh, I'm really tired, I'm really tired. And then he went so hard. And he was, like, really making me suffer up out to us. And I was like, you sat on my wheel for two hours because you felt bad, and now you're, like, attacking me? I got, I got mad about that, but those were probably all of the, all of the times. As far as going bike packing or, or what you did, um, what is your one piece of advice you give to someone who's thinking of doing it with a friend so your friendship remains intact at the end? <laughs> um, well, I think uh, you just have to be patient with each other. It's like any relationship. <laughs> no, I think, um, yeah, just be patient with each other and, and keep yourself well fed. I think you will have some moments where you're really hungry. You just have to kind of accept those moments and uh, not say anything to each other. 
until you've been fed up, <laughs> until you've got some food in your belly. I guess just realize that it's it's not it, there. You're going to have stressful times, and it's going to be stressful for everyone. So keep that in mind because you might piss people off yourself too. <laughs> From going cycling with friends to going cycling solo and making friends on the way. We're going to hear from Ishbel Holmes, who our colleague on the regular cycling podcast, Richard Moore, went to meet. Ishbel is the author of Me, My Bike and a Street Dog Called Lucy. Now, this is an astonishing story. I mean, what Ishbel did and in fact what any of these riders who've gone off and ridden around the world or halfway around the world unsupported with with virtually no money to their name as Ishbel Holmes did it's kind of inspiring but also terrifying to me I know I could not do that yeah I'm absolutely with you on that one I just I the fact that she even talks about just the whole not having money and just re- not even relying really on on maps it's just phenomenal i'm actually this was one of the most probably so far to date it's been a story that really has blown me away actually when i listen to it well ishmael holmes is scottish iranian she'd always ridden a bike but took up bike racing uh, when the sir chris hoy velodrome opened in i think 2012 around about then and she uh, was was a decent track sprinter and went off to ride with the Iranian national team and uh, she was with the Iranian national team when she basically well she did a runner from them and decided that instead of trying to race on the track she would go and ride around the world she met a street dog on the way called Lucy she started a blog which then turned into a book the book's been incredibly well received and it is an amazing story and so let's hear from Ishbel Holmes now yeah so I've always had a bicycle in my life. Um, when I was a wee girl I used to pretend that my bicycle was my horse because I was never going to get a horse and I used to ride it as fast as what I could to make it more believable that it was a horse um, and then I progressed from that to use the bicycle for commuting. I don't have a driving licence, I've always just used my bicycle for commuting and then I got into club riding um, and then I got into road racing, I was road racing all over the UK for a few years and then I got into velodrome sprinting <laughs> I was later on before I got into the racing side of it and then I ended up racing for the Iranian national women's team and then as a, a sprinter and from there I um, went straight into cycling the world so that's my history in a nutshell <laughs> I like that straight from sprinting to cycling the world yeah. I mean the two it, Opposite, opposite extremes. T- tell me a bit more about that well, jump from sprinting to riding around the world. Yeah, clearly I didn't really think that whole process through because it hurt like hell. Um, like I was training my maximum distance really. That like I was focused on training for 500 meters. So I went from like intensive training for 500 meters to cycling the world. Um, and not only that, I went from carbon bicycles that you lift up and down with your pinky to impress your mates to a fully loaded bicycle. And because I was so skint, I had no money. All my equipment was the cheapest of cheap stuff, so it was huge. I looked like a cycling tank. And obviously, I was leaving sport behind, but I still had that mentality because the first thing that I did on my fully loaded bicycle was go and ride all the famous climbs that were in the Tour de France, which was ridiculous being a sprinter and like hating hills, but that's what I'd done. So, I mean, at first, I'm just going to be honest, like, I had pretty shameful moments at first because like I remember one, it wasn't even a mountain to be honest with you, I mean, you could call it a hill, but I was cycling up. You know, um, and it was a lot of effort and a group of geriatrics jogged past me. They didn't just jog past me, they actually were talking, chatting away when they jogged past me. And it was a soul destroying moment. And I just had to look down at the, the road underneath my pedals. I couldn't deal with that. So that's how I actually, that was the transition over. So I definitely would recommend if you're going to go from sprinting to cycling the world, just maybe do a few weeks of training beforehand. T- tell me though, you, I mean, when you were riding for the Iranian national team where were you based then and what was the spur what was the thing that made you give that up and want to do something completely different yeah so I was in Tehran um, in Iran when you're racing for the national teams any sort of um, programs that you're on or training camps we all train together so all the athletes from all the different um, sports it's a huge big complex it's got a big huge lake velodrome cycling areas so that's where I was and I really just to be honest with you I didn't really like 
Um, I didn't really like the world I was in then. It wasn't suited to me. I'm more of a hippie kind of person. And I just, like, woke up one morning and I thought, oh, like, what am I doing? This isn't really for me. But obviously you work so hard to, do, to get somewhere, anything, anything in life, and then you, you can get there and decide, oh, my God, I don't actually like this place up where I'm in. So I just drew a line through it and decided to go and try something else rather than continue in a world that I didn't really like and plus the reason I went to ride for Iran was because um, I really wanted to learn about my roots and I wanted to learn Farsi and sort of try to connect with family over there so that was my my reason as well but it was really tough being a female cyclist in Iran Um, I assumed that because the Iranian team was under the UCI I just assumed a lot of things um, about Iran and women cycling and what they portray is different than what happens I mean my teammates some of my teammates had been arrested multiple times for riding their bikes one of my friends just a few weeks ago she she was rushed to hospital for brain scans because she was beaten up so badly because she she won't stop riding her bike in public so this is all still going on just now um, which is why I'm one of the like campaigners for Iranian Women Love Cycling because there's women there that are fighting for their right to ride their bikes and to do that they're giving up so much because in many parts of Iran if you ride a bike and you're a woman you're seen as a bad woman you won't get a good husband you won't get a good job you're seen as trouble so these women that are fighting to ride their bikes in the more traditional parts of Iran are really giving up a lot in their life to do it so did you encounter that yourself riding in I mean did you ride in Iran outside the velodrome were you training on the roads well, and stuff yeah but I mean I was under the care I was signed into the care of the Iranian national team so I mean I I wasn't allowed to go out of the complex on my own. I, um, If I wanted to go out on my own, then I would always have a support vehicle behind me that had a siren. So <laughs> it was so surreal cycling. And then if any cars were coming off of slipways, I mean, I'm a cyclist. I've spent my life on roads. I know how to deal with traffic. But they were so scared that the siren would come on and I'd be mortified. <laughs> so it was a big event to go cycling on your own. But... I mean, so that I didn't go cycling on my own in when I was in Tehran, but um, I mean, I tried to hire bikes and stuff in Iran. Um, I went backpacking there once and I was told that I wasn't allowed to hire the bikes, the bicycles, um, because I was a woman. They were not allowed to, to hire bikes to, to women, so um, that was really frustrating. So when you decided to go off and do something completely different, what, what did you do? What were the steps you took? How 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 did you leave Iran? I mean, you didn't ride out of Iran. Where did you go? Um, where did you get the bike that you were going to ride around on? Yeah, so basically the team were flat. We flew back from Kazakhstan and um, the management for the team were on the next <laughs> plane and I basically, I just had enough and I went to... Um, dump my stuff at the velodrome, grabbed my old training bicycle, a backpack that didn't have anything in it it was just so quick I got a taxi to the um, airport and I saw like there was a flight to Turkey Istanbul I didn't need a visa because I had an Iranian passport it was the quickest and cheapest flight so I just got it and then I jumped on another flight down south of Turkey because I realized I didn't have a tent or jacket with me or anything and I spent like I cycled up from Antalya in the sunshine um, and I, I just knew that I needed a few weeks to just decide what I was going to do. I knew I was leaving sport, but there was no way I was going to go back and work in an office because that just didn't satisfy me. Um, and well, actually, when I went there, um, because my skin hadn't had any sunlight for months, like the only, like, it was just my face that had sunlight on it, like all my skin all blistered, blistered really badly. Um, because obviously in Iran I have to wear hijab even when I'm racing and it was when I was cycling in Turkey I I bumped into another cycle tourist who was fully loaded and I was listening to all the tales and I decided that was what I was going to do and I cycled to the nearest airport, got a flight back to Scotland, sold all my stuff in car boot sales, I bought a £300 city bike, loaded it up, all the wrong equipment and off I went. I just followed my heart and it's turned out to be the best thing I've ever done. Did you ever hear back from the Iranian Cycling Federation, from the people you'd sort of run away from? Did, was there any comeback on that? Yeah, yeah, well, um, what happened was um, the Iranian team owed me money 
for a flight, but they owed all the women on the team money. And actually, like on the training camp that I was on with them, the last one, um, so all the families got letters that they're, you know, the athletes were going to come and everything was going to get paid for. Um, and then when we were in the camp, the women, we all got pulled aside and were told, you, look, you're not getting reimbursed at all. Um, and like, for example, the women all got their phones taken off them, but none of this happened with the men. So yeah, I was in touch with them, obviously demanding my money back, but obviously there's there was there's banking sanctions, so it's not like they can just do a transfer, but they refused all the women on the team, like the money that they would them, and that's just the way it was, that's the way it is there. They can do whatever they want with women, athletes, and you know what, if you protest or you say that it's not right, you're off the team. And it was in Iran, before my experiences in Iran as a cyclist, I was not interested in women's rights. I'd never, nothing had happened in my life to inspire me to go in that direction. But when I was in Iran and I saw what women were giving up and what they were suffering through just to ride their bicycles, that's when I became passionate about that side of things. Um, but I went off to cycle the world and had a great time, lots of amazing experiences. It changed my life forever and myself. And it was when I was cycling across Bolivia that the Supreme Leader of Iran issued a fatwa against women riding their bikes in public. And I had always kept quiet about women's rights in Iran because I've wanted to go back. And I just really spat the dummy when the Supreme Leader that happened. And I was already involved with women's rights in Bolivia. So my friend said to me, oh, why don't we hold a press conference and you can speak out if you feel so strongly? And I was like, yeah, that's it. I've made the decision. And I thought it was going to be a tiny little press conference in Bolivia. All the press were there, like all the different television networks. And um, so that went out everywhere. Because of that and because of like what I was saying and then I, I campaigned for the Iranian women cyclists. When I was cycling, um, I was getting the local people to hold up the signs, hashtag Iranian women love cycling and I did that all the way along. So I can't actually go. I'll get into Iran if I go back but I'll go to prison if I go to Iran now. So um, I might as well keep going with my campaign for the women there. <laughs> I mean... You said it, it was life-changing, you know, riding around the world. You ended up in Bolivia, and there's a lot of stuff about Bolivia on your on your website, your blog, and so on. Um, but tell us the route that you took, you know, um, if you can talk us through. You know, did you start from Scotland and, and ride from there, or, or what, 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 what took you? I mean, how did you get to Bolivia? Yeah, so from Scotland, I had my 300-pound city bike, all the wrong equipment, um, and I didn't even take a jacket with me. I had black bags. For the rain and i caught a flight it was 30 quid a cheap flight to it was the cheapest flight i could find to start in the sunshine so it was 30 pound flight to nice so i just flew to nice and then i, I cycled up the alps um and yeah through switzerland back down and I, and I was cycling towards iran because i was going to the Iranian national team to get my money i was saying no for an answer i wasn't taking it so that's why i was cycling towards iran but then when i reached turkey my whole trip took a turn when um that's what this book is about when i met the street dog lucy and um our journey together just changed everything and um, I, my blog as well, I started my blog in Bosnia and Herzegovina when I was cycling there. Um, I didn't even know there was landmines in that area actually, that was quite um, an experience. And I started the blog because I knew I wanted to write a book, but my English was so bad. Like honestly, see all this predictive text, I couldn't spell, my grammar was rubbish. I had a lot of swear words as well that I was using and I started this blog as a way just because like sport what I learned from sport was you can get better at anything you want all you have to do is just do it over and over and over again and you get better so that's what I was doing with the blog I thought I'll do a blog and then that means I'm writing English over and over and I'll get better and I can do a book um, and the blog took off like within the first weeks I had 10,000 um, readers on my blog um, and then I had a donate button on that as well so people were donating little bits of money like for coffees and stuff which because my outgoings were so little because I was wild camping and on a bicycle it meant that I was able to keep travelling so I just I just didn't bother going I didn't bother even going for my money <laughs> from the Iranian team so and then after that I, I took time out to go backpacking in Iran and then I went to South America 
So you did, you did go back into Iran at that point. That was before, obviously, you're, you, you spoke out. Yeah, I went back into Iran, yeah, um, and it was just, yeah, I went into Iran and I backpacked. Um, I needed some time off with the bike, um, but that's all part of the book. Um, and I went to Iran in a backpack for a few weeks and it was so funny because <laughs> at first when I was there like everyone told me I wasn't to go in like um, I, it was so dangerous and it's just rubbish it's not and um, I went in and I had like hitchhiking doesn't exist there the concept doesn't exist so I was standing with my thumb out as you do like I've done it in so many countries I'm standing with my thumb out and I wondered why like nobody was stopping and why I was getting really like angry looks and it's because that sign in Iran is the equivalent of giving the two fingers. (laughs) So yeah, I went there and then I took my bike. I ended up getting the Stanforth Bikes um, Expedition Kibble Bike and um, so I take photographs of that for all his um, brochures and stuff and I took that to South America and I started at the very bottom point um, in Tierra de Fuego which is land of fire and I cycled all the way up and I was going to keep cycling to Peru but then I decided at the top of Chile that I wanted to go across to Bolivia so I just turned right because I don't actually use maps for what I do because um, honestly I know that sounds funny but if I use maps I would be lost the whole time every day so I just don't use maps I, well I guess you're not you're not going anywhere for you, so it doesn't matter in yeah, a way. Yeah, I just yeah, I just cycle towards like another country or like yeah. Um, I really that suits my personality and me better. Has that led to any, um, you know, sort of well, not a wrong turning because you can't take oh, a wrong turn if you're not going anywhere. But have you ended up going in a direction you didn't want to go in? Yeah, well, it's uh, yeah. There's been a few, only a few, you know, in the grand scheme of things. I'm still going to travel without maps. Um, but you know, for example, the Alpe de Uz. Have I said that right? Alpe de Uz. Alpe de Uz. Yeah, that's it. See, my English is rubbish. <laughs> the fact I'm an author is <laughs> amazing. So I went up that that place. I'm not going to repeat it. Um, and I was fully loaded. And like, what's that? Is that got about 21 switchbacks or something? And I, and I got to the top and I was knackered and all the carbon cyclists were all passing me by and I was raging, you know, because I still have this sport mentality sometimes. And it gets to the top and I'm so happy I'm at the top and then I realise that the road doesn't go over the other side. I was raging. <laughs> so I had to go all the way back down the way I'd came. And if I'd known that, if I had looked at a map and, and seen that, then I definitely would have just hid all my bags behind a bush at the bottom cycled up and then cycled down a lot easier but little things like that a lot of the time it is cycling up the top of a hill on a mountain and I get there and there's no road over the I hate to tell you but there is actually a road over the top there's a little road Um, it takes you down a different side sorry you look disappointed oh my god is there is it a tarmac road yeah it might not have been when you did it it's been improved more recently because the Tour de France used it a couple of years ago this was in 2014 probably since then Right, so not when I done it. Please, this is really important. It was 2015 the Tour de France went up there yes. and, and down the other side. Yeah, because it definitely wasn't. When I'd done it, I checked with everyone. I'm going to have to Google this. I'm going to have to Google it. Yeah, so... <laughs> anyway, it's done now. It's for, yeah. it's, it's in the past. So, um, so, I mean, tell me how you've... You know, this has been a long a long time now. Five, four or five years you've been basically oh, yes. riding your bike. Yeah, I come... I come back to visit though I visit friends because I feel that um, when you're on the road well for me when I'm on the road all the time and I'm traveling and I know it sounds amazing but it becomes really normal and then I can rock up to the most amazing landscapes in the world and I'm neither up or down and then it gets to the point if somebody was to say to me Ishbel here's them um, tickets you're, you're going to go to Thailand or Paris or wherever I would just go to the airport like, just go and do it. It would be normal. But if you said to me, Ishbel, here's a flat, there's a couch, there's Netflix for a day, I would be really excited about that. So when I get to that point, I come back and just go back into normal life here and then I'll go back again. So, so you've not actually... I mean, you didn't set out to ride 
around the world in a in a line. You you you've, oh, you're more of an explorer. No, no. Yeah, yeah, and it definitely not anything. To, I mean, I couldn't imagine anything worse than trying to get from A to B as fast as what I could. I cycle as slow as is humanly possible. Like my friends really make fun of me because they're like, it's not even about how many miles you cycle on a day; it's how many corners you get around. <laughs> like that's how little. But I love it because, and I love having no plans. I love having no route because I just wake up in the morning have my coffee beautiful landscape pack up my tent pack up my stuff cycle on I never know what's going to happen and it means I can really ex- respond to each experience as it happens like I meet all the locals like some of the coolest places on the planet I've just got stuck there for weeks at a time before I pedal on I was going to ask what's what's been your favourite place to ride a bike? I would say my favourite place but it was also my most horriblest place with the been back on here <laughs> Because, you know, like, obviously before I went there, I I researched some blogs and they were all saying cycle north to south in South America. But I was like, oh, you know, I I raced bicycles. That won't apply to me. I'm like trained. I'll be fine. I'm like really tough and strong. Biggest mistake I've made of my whole trip was cycling south to north in South America because the headwind was just ridiculous. My face, like the wind burn my face my lips were all bleeding and then the most terrible thing was I would see the cyclists coming passing me from north to south and they'd have big happy smiles on their faces and they wouldn't even be pedaling and they'd be going so fast past me and then there was me like (laughs) struggling in Patagonia so it was really tough conditions there wasn't a lot of things like shops and stuff but um, I had when I did the South America I had a 70 litre rucksack strapped onto the back of my bicycle because I would leave my bicycle and then go off trekking um, so Torres del Paine was an amazing experience hanging out around Mount Fitzroy in Argentina as well was really cool and then cycling to all the glaciers the, the um, king penguins like amazing and then cycling across Brazil was really really good as well but that was really dangerous um, but it was really good and going through the Pantanal jungle oh my god listeners okay really you have to go and check out the Pantanal jungle you can cycle through it there's tracks you have got like alligators and stuff on each side of you but it is actually really safe um, as long as you're just careful when you're wild camping because there is um, jaguars that roam about at night but the Pantanal jungle is incredible because you're cycling and you've got all different coloured parrots flying around your head blue mccoy parrots in the trees it was just amazing most dangerous situation um, probably like you know, when I crossed over into Bolivia the first night, I mean, I had to cross the Andes, so I was still, I was at about 4,000 metres, and I was in a little refuge because there was a storm, but there was no locks on the doors or anything, and it was freezing because there, there, there were spaces between the actual windows and the wall, um, and uh, a member of the Bolivian army, like, I woke up with a flashlight in my face, and um, that was really, really scary. I had to, like... Yeah, get really angry for him to leave my room. And then, of course, I did cycle um, along the Syrian border when the war was going on. And um, because I was going to visit a refugee camp up in Rianley, um, that was that was dangerous. But nothing happened when I did that. Well, I did get taken by the Syrian Revolution (laughs) into the Syrian Revolution Command Centre, but um, I didn't feel like threatened or anything there. So. It gets to a percentage with me. If it's too, if I think it's too dangerous for my life, I won't do it. Like I was cycling towards the Amazon, and I was hearing a lot of stories, and it was getting a bit too dangerous for me. The chances of something happening to me, and then the school teacher was murdered there just before I was going to go in, and I just cut, I, I cut my trip short in, in Brazil. And I've not got a problem with stopping things if I think it's too dangerous on my own. So I've written a memoir about um, cycling through Turkey and a street dog that I rescued there and what happened as a result of that but also the book is also based in Scotland because it has flashbacks back to my life when I was um, 16 and in foster care, running away from foster care, being homeless um, and the parallels of actually my life in Scotland as a 16 year old kid and a street dog in Turkey and um, so I knew I wanted to write a book about Lucy, about this story, but I just didn't know how to do it. Um, and then Fran, Frank Gilhooley, who is a Scottish actor, he asked to write the film script about my life. So when that was happening, I think that kind of just gave me the confidence. 
and um, I sent out a book proposal when I was getting offers like the following week. So um, yeah, it's not. I still can't believe that I've got a book out. Like people keep saying to me, I hope it's really successful. I don't care because the best thing ever is for me even to just get a publishing deal. I'm happy with that. Anything else is a bonus. And tell me, you telling me earlier how you wrote the book and where you wrote the book. Yeah, so I was um, so I was cycling. I cycled across Brazil the year before last and then I went back last year to cycle up to the Amazon but um, I ended up rescuing a couple of dogs that were dying and I got them to a a shelter, Dogs in Brazil shelter and um, yeah, I wrote the book there. I had three months to write the book so as it could be published this year and I was so skint, I'd done it (laughs) Um, and I just drank lots of coffee in this dog shelter in Brazil in the middle of the, like, Cloud Forest and um, yeah, managed to write the book in three months. So I was a bit nervous when it came out because you think, oh, your first book, you want it to be like really good and your best work in three months. Like I was on two hours sleep a night, um, but the response from people has been incredible. Like it's five star reviews so far. So um, that maybe works for me then. Tight deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what next for you then? Um, you, you're doing this this tour, talking about the book, but. Any more trips planned this year? And what you know, what what what's what's is there a place you want to particularly go now? Yeah, so um, I'm cycling the UK. Um, I'm cycling to all my speaking events in the UK with my dog Maria, one of the dogs that I rescued last year in Brazil. Uh, Where does the dog go on the bike? Um, she well, she sits in the saddle and she pedals for me. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm joking. Obviously. Oh, you're joking, are you? <laughs> I wish. I wish. No, my dog's in a trailer. It's in a tra- my dog's in a trailer on the back attached to the bike. So clearly I am owned by my dog, not the other way around, because I've cycled her up the hills. Have you heard of the Bealnick Bar Hill in Scotland? I've cycled my dog up that, right? And it was a, it's a 13 kilogram trailer. It's a 17 kilogram dog. I've got all my stuff, my camping stuff and that. And the Bealnick Bar is too busy a road to let a dog walk up on its own. And um, there was so much weight, it was actually it pulled off my back wheel four times when I was cycling. And I actually got over the Bealnick Bar pulling my dog. Um, so she goes in that. So we're cycling the UK for my speaking tour. And then the book's been published in the USA and Canada at the end of October. So um, hopefully I'll get a visa and I want to go over there and do speaking tours there. And then once I'm finished this, then I just, I've got a calling to go to Nepal. I want to go to Nepal. Um, with my dog and do some work with the children over there. I want to go and learn about the the children in Nepal. Yes, yeah, so I'll head over there. That summer you've not been yet? No, I've not been to so many places I've not been to. Like, because as well, I'm so slow at cycling. <laughs> like, people can see the world and, like, realistically, people can see the world in a couple of years, right, when they're cycling. But I'm just, like, on this trip, I've only cycled 16 countries, which is really poor effort. <laughs> feel a bit humble and embarrassed to be honest asking Ned and Simon to take my luggage to Suffolk and then hearing what Ishmael Holmes did I'm just not made of the same material unfortunately I mean it's one of the most phenomenal stories I think that the fact of everything she's done with being in Iran and then the women's rights and now essentially not being able to go back there because she'd be under arrest to just trying to figure out how to ride from country to country without knowing what, where to go because you're not using a map. It's just, I'd, that would make my anxiety levels go to another, just off to another scale. But I think the thing that's quite interesting as well is that she's obviously come from a background that has been such a tough background. She's obviously suffered with mental health problems and this has been her way of kind of helping her deal with that, which is quite phenomenal, really, really incredible the power of the bike once you get going you never know where it will take you um although i know that it probably won't take me around the world the 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 2019 edition of the lionel's low route will will almost certainly not leave england (laughs) not even with ned and simon taking your things will it no matter how many refills simon gill does of the bike be done no no oh dear anyway well that is enough of episode four it's not enough of episode four we could extend the fun but the fun continues in episode five of explore which will be released next week so until then hannah thank you very much thank you lionel next time on explore 
just taking a breather, just done a hundred kilometers so far today. So I thought I'd stop off and munch on some um, cola bottles. Just been in my head evaluating how long it's gonna take me the whole process. Yeah, just changing my thoughts on how to ride, how to ride this thing really. And I've come to the conclusion that, well, I'm no, I'm no Bear grills, basically. <laughs> basically, I, I want to enjoy it. So if I spot somewhere that looks like they're going to serve a nice Irish stew, I'm going to stop for an hour, have a nice Irish stew and try and try and look around me and enjoy the ride kind of thing. You have been listening to Explore by The Cycling Podcast. The producer was Tom Wally. Music in this episode, including our opening theme, Beyond the Black Veil, is by Moscow Youth Cult. Their latest album, Brutalist, is out now on Hello Thor Records. You can find it via hellothor.bandcamp.com. This episode also featured additional music by John Dix.